The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, in the last program, we were talking about how after the conversion of Paul and the stopping of the persecution which he was leading, the church had a time of rest, but because of Paul's persecution, the church had been scattered and they went north and they went to Antioch. And in Antioch, the church began to explode. And so when the leaders in Jerusalem, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, heard of what was going on in Antioch, they decided to send someone to see what was taking place and see if they can help. And so they sent a man called Barnabas, who was known as the son of consolation, which means he was a guy that knew how to relate to other people. They sent Barnabas to Antioch and immediately Barnabas perceived that a fresher point of view, a clearer insight, a wider culture, and a more complete immunity from prejudices was needed for so large and delicate a task. Now Barnabas was himself a Grecian. What do we mean by that? We don't mean he was Greek, he was Jewish. But he had been exposed to Greek culture and so he had a wider point of view. And now he was called upon to minister not only to Grecians, but also, that is to Jews who had been influenced by Greek culture, but to Greeks. And he longed for the aid of someone who would maintain the cause of truth and liberality with superior ability and more unflinching conviction. In other words, they needed a man who was flexible in one sense, in a cultural sense, but not a compromiser where the truth was concerned. And there was but one man who in any degree met his requirements. The only man he knew of who would fit this bill, so to speak. And it was the delegate of the Sanhedrin, the zealot of the Pharisees, the once persecuting Saul of Tarsus that Barnabas knew could do this job. Well, since his escape from Jerusalem, Saul had been more or less unnoticed by the leading apostles. And we lose sight of him at Caesarea when he was apparently starting on his way back to Tarsus. And all that Barnabas knew now about Saul or Paul was that he was quietly living at home, waiting on the call of the Lord. So accordingly, Barnabas set out to seek for Saul. Now remember, it's about 300 plus miles journey, 350, 360, from Caesarea to Tarsus, straight north on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, Barnabas set out to seek Paul, and the turn of expression used in the New Testament seems to imply that it was not without some difficulty that he finally found him. Well, Paul readily accepted the invitation to leave his seclusion and to join his friend Barnabas in the great capital of Syria, which was Antioch. So thus, twice over, two times, did Barnabas save Paul for the work of Christianity and to the self-effacing nobleness of Barnabas is due the honor of recognizing, before it had been revealed to others, the fiery vigor, the indomitable energy, the splendid courage, the illuminated and illuminating intellect which were designed and destined to spend themselves in the high endeavor to ennoble and evangelize the world. Paul not only knew the Lord and knew the word, 
but he had the ability to convey that gift to others. Some people can do, but they can't teach. And it takes someone who has an ability to communicate and to nurture. And strangely, Paul had this ability. Now, no place could have been more suitable than Antioch for the first stages of such a ministry. Antioch was called the Queen of the East, the third metropolis of the world, third biggest city in the Roman world. It was the residence of the imperial legate of Syria, the legate from Rome. And this vast city of perhaps 500,000 souls. Now you may say, today? That's not a big city. Back in those days, that was a big, big city. And so this vast ancient city of a half a million people must not be judged by the diminished, shrunken, an earthquake shattered Antiochian of today. It was no mere oriental town with flat, low roofs and dingy, narrow streets, but it was a Greek capital enriched and enlarged by Roman munificence. In other words, Rome funded it. And it is situated at the point of junction between the chains of the Lebanon and the Taurus Mountains. And its natural position on the northern slope of Mount Silvius with a navigable river, namely the broad historic Orontes flowing at its feet and with a once commanding and beautiful view, the windings of the river encircled the whole well-wooded plain. And as the city was but 16 miles from the shore, the sea breezes gave it health and coolness, very significant in the east, in the Middle East. And these natural advantages had been largely increased by the lavish genius of ancient art. Well, it was built by the Seleucids or the Seleucid kings as the royal residence of their dynasty. And the wide circuit of many miles of the city was surrounded by walls of astonishing height and thickness. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bible, and that allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. talking about the city of Antioch, great city, third most important city in the Roman Empire. 
Now, it had a circuit of many miles, and it was surrounded by walls of astonishing height and thickness. Remember this, that before the day of modern artillery, walls were a great defence against any attacker, and archaeology has shown that in the civil wars between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Israel, the walls were 30 feet thick. So on top of these walls, they could put basically roads, so to speak, and uh, chariots could run along with, uh, with archers, run along the top of these walls. Well, the city of Antioch was surrounded by walls of astonishing height and thickness, and it had been carried, that is, the wall had been carried across ravines and mountain summits with such daring magnificence of conception as to give the city the, the aspect of being defended by its own encircling mountains, as though those gigantic bulwarks were but its natural walls. Well, the palace of the kings of Syria, this is interesting, was on an island formed by an artificial channel of the river. So you have the city, but within the city, you have the palace uh, surrounded by channels of a river, almost like an old English castle and moat. And through the entire length of the city, uh, from the Golden or Daphne Gate on the west, which ran for nearly five miles, a fine corso adorned with trees, colonnades, and statues ran. Well, originally, the whole thing was constructed by Seleucus Nicator, one of the Seleucid kings. And that construction had been continued by Herod the Great, who at once to, or one and the same time, to gratify his passion for architecture and to reward the people of Antioch for their goodwill toward the Jews, he had paved the street, so to speak, for two and a half miles with blocks of white marble. That is not cheap. And broad bridges spanned the river and its various streams. And there were baths and aqueducts and basilicas and villas and theaters clustered on the level plain and overshadowed by the picturesque and rugged eminences, which gave the city a splendor worthy of its fame as only inferior in grandeur to Egyptian Alexandria and Italian Rome. Well, mingled with its splendor were innumerable signs of luxury and comfort. And under the splitting or the spreading plane trees that shaded the banks of the river, there were gardens brightened with flowers, sparkling amid groves of laurel and myrtle, there were grey villas of the wealthier inhabitants, bright with Greek frescoes and adorned with every refinement which Roman wealth had borrowed from Ionian luxury. In other words, the Romans had the money to imitate the famous Greek architecture and they could do it basically without financial limit. Well, art had lent its aid to enhance the beauties of nature. And the once colossal crag of Mount Silvius, which overlooked the city, had been carved into human semblance by the skills of one Laos. In other words, it's like the place we have in the Western United States where they have the heads of the presidents carved into the mountains. They had carved the semblance of someone into the mountains and, but just one person, not several, as we have done in the United States. Well, in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, a pestilence had ravaged the kingdom. And to appease the anger of the gods, because in those days, people thought, well, if we have a pestilence, the gods are angry. Well, to appease the pestilence and anger of the gods, the king had ordered the sculptor to hew the mountain mass into one vast, statue, and the huge grim face under the rocky semblance of a crown 
stared over the forum of the city and was known to the people of Antiochus as the Chironium, being supposed to represent the head of, quote, that grim ferryman which poets write off, who conveyed the souls of the dead into his dim gleaming boat across the waters of the river Styx. <clears throat> well, this is 2020. Well, I don't think most young Americans would relate to the words I've just said, but the Greeks believed that when you died, uh, you were conveyed across the river of death called the Styx by a supernatural ferryman. Well, it was natural that a city like this, just like San Francisco, so, a city like this is going to attract a vast multitude of inhabitants, and those inhabitants were of various nationalities. Now, the basis of the population was comprised of native Syrians, represented to this day by the Maronites. But the Syrian kings had invited many, many colonists from other parts to people their city, and the most important groups that the Syrians invited to people the city were Greeks and Jews. Well, to these Greeks and Jews, after the conquest of Syria by the Roman general Pompey, they had added a garrison of Romans. And the court of the legate of Syria, surrounded as it was by military pomp, attracted into its glittering circle, not only a multitude of rapacious and domineering officials, but also that large body of flatterers, slaves, artists, literary companions, dancing girls and general hangers-on, whose presence was deemed essential to the state of an imperial viceroy. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations, and it all begins with native missionaries. All by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners. Often facing hostile opposition, they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs. World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, child care, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. Well, Antioch was autonomous or self-governing. And uh, under and within the Roman Empire, a uh, city could be autonomous if its dignity deserved it, as long as it obeyed the rules and didn't do anything silly. Antioch was such a city, and their people were such a people. And as a consequence, Antioch was free from property tax 
which made it a pleasant place of abode to many people. And the soft yielding and voluptuous Syrians, the cunning, versatile and degraded Greeks added their special contributions to the general corruption of the place engendered by an enervating climate and a frivolous society. Hot tropical climates, strangely enough, make for decadence. Cold climates tend to produce rather stricter people. Well, side by side with these things, governed as at Alexandria by their own archon and their own mimic Sanhedrin, but owing allegiance to the central government at Jerusalem, there was an immense colony of Jews. And Libanius could affirm from personal experience that he sat in the agora, or he who sat in the agora of Antioch might study the customs of the world. This was a very cosmopolitan place. So this gentleman Libanius said you could basically sit in Antioch and study the customs of the world, people from all over the world. Well, cities that are liable to the influx of heterogeneous races are rarely otherwise than immoral and debased. That's an interesting phenomenon. You mix races in a population and it tends to immorality and debasement, regardless of what the politically correct people and the sociologists would tell us. Hit history witnesses of this. And even Rome, in the decadence of its Caesarism, could groan to think of the dregs of degradation in Antioch, the quacks, the panderers, the musicians, the dancing girls who poured into this Tiber, that's the name of the main Roman river. Um, so they called this river in Antioch the Tiber of Syria. And her satirist, that's the satirist of Antioch, spoke of this infusion of Orientalism as adding a fresh miasma even to the corruption which the ebbing tide of glory had left upon the sands of Grecian life. There is nothing more dangerous than faded glory. That's a dangerous, dangerous business. Well, it seems as though it were a law of human intercourse that when races are commingling in large masses, the worst qualities of each appeared intensified in the general iniquity. The mud and silt of the combining streams pollute any clearness or sweetness that they may have previously enjoyed. And if the Jews had been less exclusive, less haughtily indifferent to the moral good of anyone but themselves, they might have stopped, checked, held in check the tide of immorality. But the disdainful isolation of the Jews either prevented them from making any efforts to ameliorate the condition of their fellow citizens or rendered their efforts negative. Their synagogues, one at least of which was a building of some pretension, adorned with brazen spoils which had belonged at one time to the Temple of Jerusalem and had been reassigned by Antiochus Epiphanes in a fit of remorse to the Jews of Antioch. These artifacts rose in considerable numbers among the radiant temple of the gods of Hellas. But the spirit of those who worshiped in them rendered them an ineffectual witness. And the Jews were absorbed in the conviction that they were the sole favorites of Jehovah. 
They felt they were the Lord's special people. And they passed with a scowl of contempt or spat devoutly brutal in the face of many of the statues which no classic beauty could redeem from the disgrace of being dumb idols. Now there were doubters, doubtless other proselytes besides Nicholas and Luke, but those proselytes, whether few or many in number, had, up to this period, not exercised any appreciable influence on the gay and guilty city. And if the rest of the Jews despised all attempts at active propagandism, there were sure to be many lewd and wicked Jews who furthered their own interests by a propaganda of iniquity. And if the Jewish nationality has produced some of the best and greatest of men, we must remember and be fair that it has also produced some of the basest and vilest of men. And the Jews of Antioch were of just the same mixed character as the Jews of Alexandria or Rome or Paris or London. And we may be quite sure that there may have been many among them. Instead of witnessing for Jehovah, who would only add a tinge of original wickedness to the seething mass of atheism, idolatry, and polluted life. The Jews might have done something to improve the moral tone, but did not. The change in your pocket could probably feed a child in a developing country for a day or more. The sad fact is that a child dies every six seconds in the third world simply because of a lack of a few cents of food or medicine. You can save a child or a family today through WME's Food for Hunger program. A gift of any amount can provide not only food, but hope, compassion, and love. For many, waiting is not an option. They have run out of tomorrows. But you can change that by simply getting involved right now. And give what you have so that you can feed a hungry person today.